still Father Carr. Mark, it's good to see you again. Well, it is great to see you again. It's the last a long time, time since we saw. The last time we were here together, you took me for that fine walk out in the country by Burford. Did I? Yeah, it's good. And and I'm glad I gave you some exercise while you were over here. <laughs> but we didn't go jogging, did we? No. No, no. We didn't, though. I could use a little <laughs> bit. What if you, before we go into the library mm. to talk about your journey, if you could tell us just a little bit about the place where we're standing? Well, this is when Newman came out uh, in 1841, um, after the condemnation of Tract 90, where he'd tried to give a Catholic explanation of the 39 Articles of the Church of England, which was, obviously, English people took that to be a very Protestant document, the kind of title deeds of the Church of England. And from the Tractarian point of view, the point of view of the Oxford movement, this was a big obstacle, because these articles seemed to make it so clear that the Church of England was Protestant. Mm -hmm. And when that tract, as he tried to give a, a Catholic interpretation to those 39 Articles, after its condemnation, uh, he came out here and more and more convinced that he was um, uh, the, the, that he was going to become a Catholic, and so he came out here and, and a group formed around him, and they came out here for to live a very ascetical and a, a very prayerful, a austere life out here in Littlemore, which was then a little village outside Oxford, is now of course more or less a suburb of Oxford. Hmm. I was wondering, for so many converts, they go through this stage where, hmm. because of what they've learned and studied and become convicted. They know they can no longer stay what they were, but yet because they've spent so much time anti-Catholic, they're not ready to go to the Catholic Church. So yes. they end up in this this kind of a no man's land for a while. Is that kind of what he was going through at this period in his journey? Um, I mean, was he pretty sure he was going to become Catholic? Well, his doubts, the, the doubts came first in 1839. A recent book has come out in the United States by a professor of history at Yale uh, claiming that, that, Newman, um, oh. that Newman didn't really want to become a Roman Catholic at all. Uh, this is, uh, and that and the, all this was, uh, he, he, he went over for other reasons, which were perhaps wouldn't be relevant to go into now. But the fact is that from 1839, he was in a state of considerable doubt. Um, and after 1841, those doubts, of course, grew very, very much. And we, uh, I think I think, I think what, what, what particularly horrified Newman about the condemnation of Tract 90 was to see Anglican bishops who he saw as the successors of the Apostles acting in a totally un-Catholic way. And this struck him because he was always a person who valued you know, the real and the concrete. You know, he was not a theoretical kind of thinker. And the Church of England seemed to him suddenly it, to look so terribly Protestant. But of course it took him time, as you say, it, it, he, he'd, he'd, he'd been uh, after his evangelical conversion at the age of mm. 15 in 1816, uh, he'd been given to believe that the Pope was the Antichrist. Well, th that took time, of course, yeah. gradually to get out of his system. Also, I think we have to remember that he was the leader of a, of a movement, and the leader of a movement can't afford just to... Uh, to he's got to be very, very sure before he decides to, to abandon the movement of which he is the leader, and, and of whose theology he is the principal architect. Because, at one, because the reason behind that whole Oxford movement was he believed that there was this via media that there, yes. that it was the middle way between Protestantism and Catholicism. He was completely convinced in that. Yes, it's very much what Lord Anglicans now will call, although Newman didn't use the term, a reformed Catholicism. That's how you get the best of both worlds. <laughs> you're, you're Catholic, but, but you're but you're free of the corruptions and errors of Rome. So you've you've had some sort of reformation from the 16th century, but you remain Catholic. And it was his it was his study that led to the essay and development of doctrine that kind of hurdled that barrier between starting being convinced in the Via Medea, but then doing the study and ending up in the reality that it well, wasn't a Via Medea. Well, of course, this is where, in fact, we're standing in the place, um, the room just across there, where he actually uh, wrote the essay. Is that the, right? Yes. And, and, and um, you, you, we can see the desk, in fact, in which he wrote the essay. Well, I pointed out to the audience yes. in, in one of the earlier shots, the very, it's a yeah. first edition of the essay yes. that's there. So that's where he finished well, writing that. This was, he was going to really test his conviction. You see, as he says in his great philosophical classic, The Grammar of Ascent, to be, to be certain is to know that one knows, or to be sure that one is sure. And what he needed to do out here in Littlemore was, he, uh, he, he was pretty sure, you could say he was pretty, pretty well sure, that he was in, the Anglicans were in schism, the Roman Catholic Church was the, uh, was, was the same church as the early primitive church that he so loved, the Church of the Fathers. But he had to be sure that he was sure, and he only did that, he was only got to that position when writing the essay on development of Christian yeah. doctrine, which he left unfinished, because he, he became convinced, and so he simply stopped writing it. It was rather sad in a way. I wish he'd delayed a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Taylor, it's a bit chilly out here. Yes. Why don't we take a break and we'll go into the library yes. and you can tell us about your journey. You know the these were stables, of course, when he bought them. Is that right? Yes, we'll watch where we're yeah. walking. Okay. Way, yeah. okay. and, they, and his companions lived in rooms, well, all these rooms along here. And so it was, it was a kind of monastery, really. And when Dominic Barbary, the passionist, Italian passionist, who received him into the church, 
1845, when he came here, he was absolutely amazed by the um, asceticism of the place. He says much more austere than, the, than, a, than a Catholic monastery would is be. Is this a place where people can come now for reflection? It is indeed. The, the, it's, now the, the, it's now looked after by the Sisters of the Work, um, and people do indeed come here for retreats and, and, and for, you know, now, is the library that we're going into uh, in the c condition that it was when, when Newman would have been here? Well, it wouldn't be in, it wouldn't be in exactly this condition, but this was used as the library, yes. All right. Well, thank you. Well, let's go in and you can tell us about your journey into the church. Father, we're sitting in the, the, the library here in the um, Littlemore College, and we're surrounded by books. And I know this was the library where Newman uh, enjoyed a time of study during those four years that he was here. Is there anything particular you'd like to point out here for our audience that's significant that points back to Newman's time here? Yes, well, as you can see, of course, we're surrounded by books, many books about Newman, pictures of Newman, um, pictures of his friends and so on. But the, but the one piece of furniture that I would point out to you is that desk over there on which he uh, wrote the, uh, the essay on the development of Christian doctrine, mm -hmm. a standing, as he, as he as was his custom to write. Um, so that, that is a historic uh, desk, I think. That essay that he wrote took, um, because he was more or less sure yeah. that he was going to become a Catholic, but he wanted just to test his views about development of the Roman Catholic Church was really the same church as the church of the early, of the early centuries. And so he wrote that essay and left it unfinished here when he, when he was received by Blessed Dominic Barbary into the church in October 1845. Well, the main problem with that desk, though, as the audience can see, is that his laptop would have slid right off. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope your audience can see the quill pen. So we could still, people could write great books without computers, without even fountain pens, <laughs> let alone typewriters. It's amazing we can't even conceive <laughs> yeah. of that fact that they, all that great mm -hmm. literature of mm -hmm. that time period yes. is written with quill. Yes, yes. So I think the best, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, well, characters he, of fiction were written with well, quill. Well, he did also ink. use ink pens as well, but, sure. but of course, ink pens you dipped into the ink. Right. I don't think it would all be quill. No. Well, now that we're <coughs> here, how about telling the audience, give us, your, first of all, your spiritual background before your conversion to the church. Well, like Newman, I was brought up in a conventional Church of England back, uh, background home. Um, we used to go to, as, as children, we were taken to, we were taken to church, um, to, to the conventional sort of matins. Yeah, it was non-Eucharistic. I mean, that was, that was unsacramental. Um, it wasn't liberal. I don't remember ever hearing anything that was undermining of Christianity. Um, it was unsacramental. It was undogmatic. It was mainly a question of going and singing hymns and there'd be reading some scripture and, and, and the sermon, of course. Well, Newman was brought up in very much the same kind of way until, until he was converted to evangelicalism at the age of 15. That's something I never went through. Um, but I was sent to a conventional... Anglican Church of England public school, as we call it. In American, that means private school, um, where, where it was a similar kind of Anglicanism. It wasn't high Anglicanism. It wasn't evangelical uh, Anglicanism. It was a very much the same kind of religion that I'd encountered in the local parish church. More of a culture than a faith? Yeah, I wouldn't think it was a faith. It was a kind of sentiment, I suppose, looking back on it. It was. Um, um, and so certainly, you know, I certainly would say that it, it left me with some spirituality in the sense that I, I was least interested in Christianity, and I mean, and I, I but I stopped going to church when I, when I was, uh, well, when I left school, and I no longer had to go, and when I came up here to Oxford, I, um, I stopped going to church altogether. So, what was so life like at Oxford? I mean, to us Americans, we just see this image that we've seen in movies and books, and <laughs> this wonderful guys in gowns and punting on the Thames. Well, I was never any good at punting, um, <laughs> but um, I don't think <laughs> the Oxford of Brideshead Revisited had pretty well disappeared. Okay. Well, there were still traces of it when I was, when I was here at Oxford. All right. So, but while you were here, the, the, your faith was not an active part of your life in your study? Well, uh, in, in, it must have been in my second year here. I okay. was out in Florence, actually, trying to learn on a course there and learning Italian and so on, and, uh, and I had a, a conversion experience there. Because um, I'd never lost my interest in Christianity. I mean, it, it seems to me something you've certainly one ought to think about. I mean, I didn't just abandon going to church simply as a, because I couldn't be bothered. It was, it was a conscious feeling that I wasn't sure. And I, I, um, but I had this conversion experience in Florence, mm. and which convinced me that, that, um, that Christianity was true. What led to that? Yeah, tell, tell us more about well, that. Well, I, I think it was the problem of pain that was, that was the big uh -huh. difficulty for me problem of evil, problem of pain particularly. Um, and and I, was, uh, I was watching some slides actually, in, in, of, uh, I've forgotten now who it, of who it was, 
but it was a, there was a slide of the crucifixion by some Italian painter. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly remember those words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I, like all the conversion experiences, I think it's very difficult to describe exactly what took place. But those words some, triggered something off in me and somehow made me feel that I could, that it was possible to be a Christian and yet also um, live with this, the problem of pain. Well, here you're in a, in a spot where C.S. Lewis isn't all that far away mm. in terms of where he lived. Did his writing, especially his book, Problem of Pain, did it have an influence on your Yes, journey? I should mention that because, um, because, of course, I had been reading Lewis, and that made me realize that Christianity was certainly very much, very well, well worth taking seriously. I mean, it was something that was a challenge. And I enjoyed Lewis very much. And, um, and his book, Mere Christianity, had a great influence on me. So, um, so, so I'm being a little bit deceitful in claiming that it was all my doing or it was the Holy Spirit's doing. It was, uh, I, I had been reading, and certainly I had been reading Lewis. Well, of course, the Lord, you always use so many different avenues, mm. and sometimes we, we don't even realize that the Lord yes. was touching us until we were looking back. Some time ago now, too. Oh. I'm getting old. <laughs> Um, then as an Anglican, you've come back to faith at that point in your so, journey? So, yes, so then I just, I realized that you couldn't just be a freelance Christian. I mean, I had no experience of that anyway. So I had to find a church to go to, and I can't actually remember why, how it was. Somebody, maybe it's a friend of mine in the college, directed it. It was admittedly the closest church to the college where I was at. It's right very next door. I went to this church, St. Mary Magdalene's, which was a very, very extreme Anglo-Catholic church in those days. Mm. And, um, and I fell under the spell, like many number of people, of the, of the vicar, Father John Hooper, who was a charismatic preacher and, and, who, uh, and who opened up to me the Catholic faith. That is to say, I learned about sacraments, I learned about um, Our Lady, Mary, I learned about the saints. Um, all this was completely new to me, you see, because I knew about the sacrament of baptism, of course, and I, and I had been confirmed and I'd received Holy Communion. But, but the whole of the Catholic the understanding of the real presence, and, and confession too, particularly confession, all that was a, simply a closed book to me. As an Anglo-Catholic, in a sense, you're, you're more Catholic than your average Anglican. In fact, you're almost Catholic except for your understanding of the papacy, right? I mean, it's almost that close, right? Well, certainly the, 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 the ritual at St. Mary Mags, as it was called, um, was, 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 far, was far, far higher more exotic than anything I think I've ever seen in the Catholic Church, practically. <laughs> Even more so. And of course, all this was completely new to me. I'd never yeah. seen people wearing berettas. And, and, uh, and also one realized, and of course, I suppose I realized very quickly, that, well, I knew this wasn't the kind of Anglicanism I'd been brought up. So it had an exotic appeal to it. And I think it, it, it was as if so that I was doing something rather illicit, because most a lot of this stuff wasn't really allowed for in the Church of England. Um, but when you say this, barring the papacy, I rather I, I doubt probably for that charismatic vicar, Father John Hooper. I'm, I think he did believe in the papacy. Oh, interesting. Because there are some Anglo-Cats. I don't know if they still exist. Who the only thing that keeps them away from Rome is the invalidity of Anglican orders, so they cannot accept their orders invalid. Okay. But there are these Anglicans called Anglo-Papalists who believe everything except Pope Leo the Thirteenth's bull on Anglican orders. <laughs> the paradox. So when you look back at your time mm. during that period, you're, before you're drawing to the Catholic Church, you're mm. an Anglo-Catholic. Well, how did you understand the papacy personally? Uh, well, well, that was that was a big problem for me because I'd um, I, I'd been impressed by C.S. Lewis's argument he got from Origen that. Um, that the Jesus Christ is either the Son of God, he's either God or he's, you know, he, he's a bad man or a madman. I mean, that you, you, can't, you can't just see, the, the Jesus of the Gospels seemed to me obviously not somebody who just went around preaching a kind of morality or, you know, being, being meek and gentle. This was clearly a, a very, very formidable figure. And it seemed to me quite obvious and he made claims that was obvious to me and his followers have made claims for him. So it seems to me that either you take the line that he is, is indeed Lewis argues, I think, in mere Christianity. Either he is God, out Deus, out homo non bonus, or he's a bad man. And it seemed to me the same was true of the papacy. I couldn't see how Anglo-Catholics could avoid the papacy. It seemed to me that either the Pope is the vicar of Christ, or he's the Antichrist, as people like Ian Paisley believe. Um, yeah. It didn't seem to me you couldn't take a kind of halfway position, and, and it, that seemed to me totally unreal. Because the Pope made certain claims, and his church made claims for him, and these had to be taken seriously. One could take the ultra-Protestant line, certainly, and dismiss them. Uh, but uh, it seemed to me one, one, either, one either did that or one had to take them on board. So when you were brought into this uh, Anglo-Catholic phase, phase of your journey, mm. journey you were put into a, an awkward position of understanding the papacy, because, you're, like you said, you were kind of doing a bit clandestine anyway with your yes. way of celebrating your faith. And uh, did the Anglo-Catholics 
see what they were doing as the via media of Newman's Oxford movement, or was it m even more Catholic than that? Well, I think there was this, this branch of Anglo-Catholicism, which uh, this, this church belonged to, the vicar belonged to, who I suppose we would call Anglo-Papalists. So they were, they'd gone a good deal further than Newman in the Anglican via media had ever really gone. Okay. I mean, these were people who, who really copied Rome in everything. Um, uh, but it seemed to me absurd to be in schism from the Pope. And it seemed to me that you had one, you know, as I said, the, the Pope either, either is the vicar of Christ or he's, uh, a, well, a bad man or a, ho a hopelessly deluded man. Very interesting. You have these group of folk that are about as Catholic as you can get, mm. and they've kind of picked and choosed those aspects mm. of Catholicism that are very, they're very comfortable with, that yeah. fits their comfortable background, but they won't go with the Pope, and maybe a few other issues. Mm. Okay, it sounds very familiar even to what we do find mm. at times in the Catholic Church of today. Mm. But let's, what is it then that brought you and grabbed you and drew you through the Catholic Church? Because it seemed to me many Anglo Catholics are very content staying exactly yes. where they are. Well, I so said the papacy played a big role. It seemed to me, as I said, the papacy is something you just simply couldn't ignore. Um, but Anglo Catholicism itself was divided. I mean, well, the church I went to was a very extreme kind of church, uh, but there was more moderate Anglo Catholicism to be found. You know, and um, and of course, those people wouldn't have gone as far as that. So Anglo Catholics vary among themselves. I think some would. Would, probably, would certainly not, many of them would certainly not accept papal claims, the majority perhaps, or at least not papal claims to the full. Um, but, but, but certainly the church I went to, that was very, very clearly, the, the Pope was seen as the Holy Father, and it seemed to me absurd to separate oneself from him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, as I said, that it was something that had to be, uh, that, that seemed to me either, either, you know, either this is, he is a vicar of Christ or this is a complete delusion. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing I think that drew me to the church and, and later on, when I came to know Newman much better, I found it in Newman, was the unreality of Anglo-Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And there was obviously the unreality of worshipping in a church where the Pope was referred to as the Holy Father, <laughs> and, where, and where all these, you know, where there was a high mass and all the sacraments were administered, and the, the fullness, really, of Catholic faith was taught. It seemed to me this was so much an unreal situation to be in. And yet, and, and yet, of course, you might go elsewhere in the country, well, most of you wouldn't find a church like that. You'd have to find it. So you were in a kind of a, you were in a curious kind of sect almost. You had to find a church in the Church of England that, that did this, you know, produced this, that, that preached and practiced this, this, this Catholicism. So there was an unreality about the whole thing, I think. And knowing, of course, that they weren't really what most people understood by the Church of England. Now that affected me very powerfully. I know it doesn't affect many people, but it did affect me. Well, um, when you made your decision to become Catholic and make that jump, what was the effect of that on your family and friends or your associates uh, that were with you when you were in that Anglo-Catholic phase? Well I, well, I had Catholic friends in, in the university. Of course, that was another thing that struck me, because by this time in Oxford, um, Roman, Roman Catholics were a pr pretty large number of the st student body, whereas Anglo-Catholics were a tiny fraction of the student <laughs> body. Um, so, so that in itself was, um, struck me at the time. You know, that here was I claiming to belong to the English Catholic Church, and yet uh, these, these other Catholics, um, who were just as English as I, as, as I was, um, and who were more, much more numerous, and belonged to this worldwide church. So I had Catholic friends. Yes, my family didn't like it. That's true. My mother didn't like it, no. I was going to say that if you have a boat parked by a dock, there's a lot more people in the boat and on the dock than those yes. with one leg in both. Yeah. And that's kind of where Anglo Catholics are. You, know? yes. you kind of want to stay here, but I, don't, like, I want a little bit of this. But, yes. Yes. And it's a very awkward position to stay yeah. in for yeah. very yeah. long. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and I remember my mother got very upset, and, and my father simply said, well, it's all your fault. Because she's a Knox, you see, and her, my grandfather's first cousin was Ronald Knox, so my father simply blamed Is it. Is that right? Yes. So my father simply blamed it on her family. That, that was the end of the matter. <laughs> Did Ronald Knox, in any of his writings, have an influence on you? No. No, I'd, I'd read no Knox at all at that time, I don't think. That's interesting. Sure, no. So that side of your family just got... Well, he was caught in the family. He was regarded as a bit, you know, sort of beyond the pale. Oh, all right. Um, so, no, I'd never read any Knox, I don't think. Oh, I might have read some of his essays, but, but so I hadn't read his Spiritual Aeneid, I don't think, oh, which is his own autobiography. But I may be wrong about that. But I had, of course, read Newman's Apologia. I remember reading it vividly, I remember clearly, vividly reading it in bed when I had flu. And it made no impression on me at all, which is somewhat <laughs> odd, considering I spent so many years of my life studying and writing about Newman. That's right. Well, now that you are, uh, you know, <laughs> undoubtedly one of the world's recognize authorities on Newman because of your writings and your work. Uh, what place did Newman play in your journey into the church? 
Well, I'm sorry to say that he really played no role at all. Although afterwards, after I had become a Catholic, um, I found I, I've, I discovered something which 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 made sense to me of why I'd found mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, such an unsatisfactory book, although such a powerful book and one that had affected me so much, as, it, as indeed has affected, well, thousands, hundreds, perhaps millions of people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it was when I was rereading the Apologia, I think, and I, he quotes there from an article of his written in 1838. This is the year before he began to have serious doubts about the Anglican position or the Via Media, the Tractarian position. And he says that, um, uh, quoting from this, this um, essay, he says that as, as early as late 1835, early 1836, he'd really understood what the real difference was between Anglicanism and Catholicism. And I was so struck by this. And he said, for, he said the, the real problem is not the papacy or any of the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. The real difference between us Anglicans, and I think this applies to Protestants as well, the real difference is the, the, the relationship between the faith and the church. Mm. And he says for Roman Catholics, um, he said, I had two images. One was the Madonna and the child. That's the Catholic one. The church holding the faith. You can't separate the two. On the other hand, he, he said, I had a, a, the other model I had was of Calvary. The faith standing there by itself, as it were, unapproachable. Mm -hmm. And in the background, the church. Yeah. And so, so and of course, this is what I realized. That, and, and then and he speaks about how he had himself believed in this idea of the fundamentals, which is C.S. Lewis's mere Christianity. Yeah. Of course, the problem, as Newman recognized at the time, was how do you decide what these fundamentals are? Who decides the fundamentals? <laughs> Newman realized that at the time. But what he, came, what he already saw as early as that was that the, the real problem wasn't about doctrines in particular. It was about the question of the, nature, of the relationship between the faith and the church. And for Anglicans and Protestants, the faith comes first and the church comes second. So in mere Christianity, you go into the hall of the house, which is mere Christianity. These are the fundamentals of the faith. And you then choose a room. You choose a church to enter. It's in, in our country, at least, when the encyclical Dominus, the letter Dominus Jesu was released, mm -hmm. it wasn't received well by all because it seemed to be pushing the church too much and then to others pushing Jesus too much. But in that document, we see both lifted up mm. as essentially important. That's yes. what you're saying, yes. the church and Jesus. How, was that received well here in England or was, was that seen as a, so non, as a, a non-ecumenical statement? Um, oh, well, I think there was considerable dismay among um, Anglicans, and of course some Catholics um, thought that it was very unecumenical. Um, because the saying just what you've said mm -hmm. is that the church is in the bosom of the church. The faith, the, the is, faith the is in the bosom of the church. Well, to me, this is, this is the fundamentally ecumenical question, which is, which is avoided so much of the time, because it, the fact is we Catholics don't accept Lewis's model. <laughs> Uh, we don't accept that there's a hallway, and then out of the, off that hallway there are various rooms. It's true, Lewis says you, you choose the door you think is the true one, not the door that looks the nicest, um, which of course raises questions, how do you decide this is the true one? But, but leaving that aside, no, for us, the, the, there's not a hallway with different rooms, there's not a hallway of the faith, and then rooms representing different churches. Different churches. No, it is the household of faith. It, it is the, the, for us, the church is this house. It is the household of the faith. And yes, we understand the Orthodox, if you like, are, are an annex to this house because we recognize that they have the same, you know, to such a large extent, have the same faith as us, the same sacraments and so on. And the other Christian bodies are more or less attached to this house. But the, 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 the house itself is the household of the faith. Newman makes this powerful statement in the beginning of the essay, to become deep in history is to cease to mm -hmm. be Protestant. And my guess is that a part of your conversion mm -hmm. from the nominal Anglicanism of your childhood mm -hmm. to the Anglo-Catholic mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. to becoming Catholic was a conversion in your understanding of the history of this country you live in. Do you remember going mm -hmm. through a, a re, kind of a re-education of yourself and understanding the history of England? Well, I'm, I don't think I really did at that point. No, of course, it's only later that I've reflected okay. more on that. Although, of course, uh, it's true. Yes, one was aware that the uh, all English people dimly are aware that the parish churches and cathedrals of this country were built by Catholics. And, and there's, there's, there's no getting around it. So, I, I mean, I think the English have, I think it's a very different experience from America, which, of course, was originally a, a Puritan country anyway, right, the right. first settlers. So I think our experience is very different. We're, we're people who, as it were, all around us here in Oxford, there's All Souls College. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> which was set up for praying, which was endowed with masses to be said for the holy souls. There's Corpus Christi College, 
So it's all around us, this Catholicism. And so you, you, I think one, one just recognizes it, yes. But it seems that there was kind of an official history that was taught. Yes. That you almost had to believe and to teach yourself to say, stay safely, at least in Elizabethan times, mm. into, the, into the good uh, in, in good with the queen. Was that what you were taught growing up? Yes, I, it's an, you're quite right. Of course, it came from history, not from what I was taught about religion. But, uh, but I was taught, we were taught in school, there was something called Good Queen Bess, mm -hmm. and there was another queen called Bloody Mary. <laughs> and I remember the, the, play, the, the suburb of London where I grew up, and, these, um, and, and there, quite a lot, there happened to be a rather large Roman Catholic settlement there. There's some two big Catholic schools and a, big, a very big Jesuit church. And I remember thinking that, that these were odd people. I still remember as a little boy getting on the bus to go to school and seeing these girls from the local convent school and thinking, that uniform is funny because they're Roman Catholics, aren't they? There's something funny about them. So yes, one grew up with that, and what that one got, I think, from history. But of course, later when I became an Anglo-Catholic, as it were, that very brief only lasted two or three years at most, um, then of course I had a very different view. Then I had to pretend, that. then I had to say, this, this, this Church of England is really the same church that existed through the centuries in England, which is the Anglo-Catholic link. But that seemed to me unreal and absurd. So yes, history did come into it. That was a part of the unreality of it. So I know that when I, in my own journey, I was taught history a certain way when I went to seminary. Mm. And <clears throat> it was actually Hilaire Belloc's book, How the Reformation Happened, and other books mm. like that, that awakened within me this whole other side of history, of England particularly, mm. that I'd never seen before. Yes. And it was amazing to me that, in, that Englishmen could grow up in the midst of this only seeing the one side and not seeing the other. Mm. But I'm wondering, are you saying that they realize the other side and it's kind of always kind of hidden? Well, I think there's a sort of subconscious, you know, that they're okay. un uneasily aware. That, you know, they, they know these churches somehow. Were, were, they, they, uh, the, the, there are Catholic symbols all around, even, even in London, you have Blackfriars, Blackfriars Tube Station. Yeah. Uh, where, where the Blackfriars were. Um, it's almost impossible to escape from it. And yet, yes, certainly I was brought up in the Protestant mythology that the Reformation had freed this country from the tyranny of Rome, from superstition, you know, and all the rest of it. And that, and that that was linked to the destiny and greatness of England, you know, that was why we'd got the British Empire was because the, the English were somehow different, you know, we were different from, the, from, from yes, and the Catholics were somehow I think that was certainly, Catholics were sort of second-class kind of people. I, I, perhaps I'm exaggerating that. Certainly in the 19th century, as you probably know, there was a great deal of that kind of racialism around, that the, 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 the Catholic races, the, the Celts and the Latins, were inferior, and the top race was the Anglo-Saxon race, the Germans and the English, the German Protestants, Prussians and the English. Uh, um, an illusion, of course, which was shattered by the First World War, and then, of course, well, by the Second World War. One of the unique things that I see different uh, about the many conversions we're seeing today as are represented each week on the Journey Home program, for example, mm, in mm. America, is that uh, today we're seeing conversions from, from many, many denominations. In the Coming Home Network, for example, we have clergymen who've converted the church from over 50 different denominations. Yeah. But before this, if you go back 100 years or so, the times of Newman, the converts were mainly from Anglicanism or Lutheranism. If you would talk a little bit on the influence of Newman on the conversion of others, did how his books and his writings influence others to make the step to the church? Yes, I mean, it, we're certainly seeing in this country now conversions from evangelicalism, but that would have been very rare in the past. They would only, not from Lutheranism, of course, there aren't any Lutherans in England, okay. but, um, but, but it normally would have been, of course, from the high Anglican um, air, section of the Church of England. Oh, Newman's influence has been uh, inestimable, I think, his influence on, uh, on converts and the number of people he's brought into the church. And you know he's he's deeply influenced quite all you know all people whose whose names aren't known, yeah. but if you look at the the great English converts writers, you uh, G K Chesterton so aware of Newman, Jared Manley Hopkins, yeah. um, the great poet became a Jesuit, received into the church by Newman, taught at the Oratory School in in Birmingham, founded by Newman. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting, I think it's about six years before he received Hopkins into the church, he wrote an essay called an Engli uh, English Catholic Literature. It was now forms part of the idea of university. It's one of the, he did it when he wrote this when he was 
president of the Catholic University of Ireland, and he said, well, of course, our literature, speaking about post-medieval literature, is, t is completely Protestant, almost completely Protestant, except Shakespeare shows signs of Catholicism. And um, there was no hope of us ever producing a, a, a Catholic literature in this country because the great age of literature has passed. This is right at the very time when, when, when Dickens is at the height of his powers, and in the time of George Eliot and, and Trollope and um, Tennyson, uh, Matthew Arne, you know, I was talking about one of the, the, the two great <laughs> periods of English literature. And, and, and he himself, six years later was going to receive one of the major English poets into the church, who was going to become one of the major English poets, Jared Manley Hopkins. And if you go forward a bit in time to you think about something like Graham Greene, fascinated by Newman's theology, mm. passionate reader of Newman, uh, Evelyn Waugh, echoes of Newman and Brideshead revisited in his Sword of Honor trilogy, very much aware of Newman. So I, I think Newman's influence is not just, he's deeply affected many, many people and has led to many, many, many conversions. How is he viewed as a convert to the church by the, the lifelong Catholics of his day. Was he well received? <clears throat> uh, yes, he got much more sympathy from the, the old Catholics, as they were then called, the old Catholics being those who had survived the penal times, persecution. Mm. Um, he was very well received by them. Uh, most of the, op the opposition he encountered in the church after he became a Catholic was sadly uh, from, uh, from his fellow converts. Oh, interesting. People like Cardinal Manning, who of course had come from a very similar background from Newman. But, but who had adopted this extreme ultramontanism, uh, which Newman thought was ahistorical for a start. Coming back you to your point what is ultramontanism? Our, our audience may not be familiar with that term. Well, ultramontanism began in France in the, in the early 19th century. And it was, a, first of all, it means literally beyond the mountains, ultramontes. And it meant, that you, it meant appealing to Rome against, the, against state control of the church. So ultramontane, and the, and the original French ultramontane thinkers certainly weren't ultramontane at all in the later sense of the word. What it came to mean, though, was very, very rigid control of the local church by Rome. And so, so ultramontanism became this very uh, extremely conservative movement that wanted to, to define a definition of papal infallibility, which, which went far beyond um, what Vatican I actually defined, okay. and which I think would, would horrify many people today. <coughs> but was it a... Oh, interesting, interesting. Was it a leaning towards Rome versus the local bishops? Well, I, 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 Newman always said that he was an ultramontane in the original sense. He had no time for this idea of a local church against Rome, which I know is quite strong in the United States. He had no time for that at all. But what he was against was this extreme ultramontanism, which, which, which really exalted the papacy in a way that was quite unhistorical and contrary to the tradition. When you think that the l'univers the French ultramontane newspaper actually substituted in a hymn the word Pius for Deus, actually put oh, the Pope's right. name in the hymn instead of the name of God. This gives one some idea of the lengths to which they went. And this, this, this shocked Newman as being contrary. But, but he fully accepted the definition of papal infallibility, you know, in, in the form in which he was. But what he was afraid of was these ultramontanes were pushing for a, a definition which would say every time the Pope opened his mouth he was speaking infallibly. One thing in, in America, it seems like often people misuse Newman and his views, especially of, of ecumenism, mm. or even his, what he was called a liberal, and misusing his understanding of liberalism. And Newman was often called liberal. Maybe you ought to define Newman's liberal views to our modern audience so they make a better perspective on what we mean by Newman as a liberal. Yes, well, I have in a way already, I've already implied this because uh, Newman always said, I, I'm an ultramontane in, in, the, in the true original okay. sense of the word. That's to say that I don't believe that, that the local and local, uh, he said, I had enough of that in the Church of England. I don't want local national churches. You know, he would have been horrified by the idea of an American church. All that he was against, he was liberal in the sense that he was against this extreme ultramontanism. You know, and we're talking now about a year which is, which is a year of the, of the, of the um, syllabus of errors, uh, and a church which, which proclaimed that democracy uh, was, 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 was against the faith. We're talking about well, there was no, when religious, religious freedom, of course, was a concept that was, uh, co was completely uh, it was anathema to the church authorities. So we're talking about a very different time from our own. I have no doubt myself that today Newman would be fully on the side of Pope John Paul II. Uh, he'd be completely against this idea of, local, of the local church, as it were, of a, of a collegiality that sets the bishops against the Pope, which is, I think, what some people mean by collegiality. Today. We also see this movement of the laity against the bishops. The laity, the laity yeah. 
And uh, of course, he wrote on what's the name of his book? Consenting on consulting the. F- no, well, exactly. You put it marvelously there. You see, because that's not the title of the book. And I, I, I'm, I'm so pleased when people make that mistake. Because on consulting the faithful in matters of doctrine, and as I, I mean, I've written an essay on this, pointing out that in that essay, uh, he, he's not. Well, he's talking about how the orthodox faith was upheld against the Arian heretics, and by many, a large amount, of, and, by, uh, and uh, was upheld by the faithful. And if you look at the faithful, it includes, yes, laity, it includes monks, holy virgins, we call nuns, religious, and presbyters, priests. Um, what Newman was saying in that, it was it's an anti-episcopal document, if anything, because he's pointing out that the body of the episcopate failed to do their job at that time uphold the orthodox faith. But that, that, that essay has been deeply misunderstood, I think. Because okay. it's not just the laity he's talking about there. He's talking about the faithful. And he includes the clergy with them. All right, well, thank you. We're going to take a break, Father. Mm-hmm. Back just a moment with some more discussion with Father Ian Carr and maybe some more uh, insight into the life and teaching of John Henry Cardinal Newman. Welcome back. We're here in Littlemore with Father Ian Carr, and he's shared with us uh, aspects of his journey of faith and also talking about uh, so much about Newman, which has become such a big part of your life. And let's go back to something you talked about earlier. If you would talk more about, on the one hand, the necessity of the church and our faith, but also its, its relationship to ecumenism, if you would. Well, I think this is, this is the major problem for ecumenism, but because we ca- Catholics don't see the church as separate from the faith, it is that, use that image of Newman, the Madonna and the child. Um, ultimately, as, as Newman said in, in a letter to, to, to Pusey, one of the other leaders of the Tractarian movement, many years later, mm-hmm. and Pusey's uh, ecumenism is now in the air. People are beginning to talk about reunion in, 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 the, in the 1860s. And Pusey writes to Newman and says, well, tell us what doctrines we have to accept. <laughs> and Newman writes back to say, no, I, I, I can't give you a list of them, he said. What you have to accept is the church. When you become a Catholic, you're not just accepting a list of propositions, because there might be a new definition tomorrow. <laughs> what you're accepting is the Catholic church, that this is the body of Christ, and you're accepting that the, 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 this is the church which is headed by the apostles and the senior apostle, the successor of Peter. And, and, and you cannot, in that sense, detach the faith from the church. You can't say, I'm, I'm going to become a Catholic because I accept Catholicism. You must accept the church, not Catholicism. Our time is so different than Newman's mm. in so many ways. Uh, I was speaking recently with uh, an associate of mine, Jim Anderson, and we were talking about how things had changed so much. And one major difference was during the time of Newman, an individual's life over their lifespan changed more than the culture. I mean, they could be born and die, and yet the culture would change very little. Whereas now we live that in our lifetime, our culture has changed so many different ways, so fast, mm. it's hard to keep up with. And it, it's, for example, in being a Catholic, uh, the church has changed so much. Not mm. the church per se, no. but so many aspects of it in our life. The outward, the outward things, yeah. Compared mm. to the time of Newman. Yes. So often I have to tell people being a faithful Catholic means being faithful to the Catholic Church right now. It doesn't right. matter what certain things that could, you know, can change were yeah. taught 50 years ago mm. or what might be taught 50 years from now. Mm. We are to be faithful now. We're as in Newman's time. But there weren't that many changes in his lifetime. Is that true? Well, well, culturally, of course, there were because he grew up in um, what was a, still a, a rural country, and there were tremendous changes in the nineteenth century. And you think he lived from eighteen o one to eighteen ninety? So he did see. Well, of course, he, he saw, saw the, the change of the. the, the uh, Vatican well, I changes. Well, yes, but he also saw yes industrialization, okay. the, the growth of the British Empire. All this was, of course, a, um, but, but particularly the Industrial Revolution, which began in, in this country. And yes, the, and the First Vatican Council, which to, to us now we, we perhaps are surprised. We, we, we take that. I hope we take that definition in our stride. We understand okay. well, it's a very it's a very carefully defined definition, uh, where the Pope is speaking the faith of the church, coming back to that what we've just been talking mm-hmm. about. The Pope simply it's not, doesn't come from him, he simply enunciates the faith of the church, if it's, uh, usually if it's under question or attack. Um, so, so there were a lot of changes, but as you say, of course, that we have, and many of your viewers will remember 
the pre-Vatican II Church. Now it's a very striking sentence, Newman, to, if I may um, play, a, play a card against you or to be deep in history is to <laughs> cease to be a Protestant. And that is where he says, obsolete customs become present heresies. Hmm. And, and, and I think that's true where, where, where you take something from the past in the church. Uh, for instance, the Tridentine Mass can be used, I think, as, as, a, as, a, as a symbol of a separation from, from the church of Pope John Paul II. Of course, a legitimately celebrated Tridentine right. Mass is fine. But certain things can be uh, clung on to in the past, which, which actually make one uncatholic, really. One's no longer with the church. Mm, that's right. The, as we were sitting here, um, around these books, Something, again, talk about these changes and how things are different today than then. Hmm. Um, I mean, here our lives are run by emails today and phone calls and how quick you know, we hmm. change and can communicate flippantly one to another. But in those days, there was a whole different world in terms of how I communicated. And what impressed me as I was sitting here is that here are two entire shelves of volumes of collections of the letters and diaries hmm. of John Henry Newman. I mean, that was so much a part of his life. And as you as a scholar talked about how important his letters and diaries are to us understanding him as a man and as a man of faith. Yes, well, actually, Newman benefited from a change in technology in his own time because of the penny post, which began in this country. Hence, I suppose, why our postage stamps still don't bear the name of the country, because we were the first stamps. <laughs> uh, like your emails are the first thing. You never have USA, do you, in your emails? Um, so the, the technology, the, the fact that posts could be delivered so quickly and in Victorian times is better than it is today in this country. You get the letter next day, I mean there'd be several deliveries or even the, possibly in the same day. Um, so so that, 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 that enabled letter writing really to flourish. Mm. And as you say, there was no phone, no telephone, uh, certainly weren't any emails. So the kind of things that people would now put in telephone calls or more recently emails would, would have been put in, in the form of letters and notes mm. in those days. So we do have this wonderful um, uh, record of Newman's life in, 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 in they saved them all. Well, the, 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 they're not all. <laughs> Many of these. I mean, are, that isn't even all then. But well, no. But he, he he only kept copies of important letters. The rest that have been published are uh, that were where where the original where the owners or the originals have come into have, be, have been discovered. You know, and people people did return their letters when there was a big appeal made. Um, so we do. I think there are about twenty thousand extant. And, and in those on. letters is where we find more of the intimate expressions of his yes. journey of faith. Yes, yes, that's where we see. And we see the, all that, that, that period of his life. Like, I mean, I think conversions differ. And there. some are very instantaneous conversions. But many people, many people's conversions uh, were rather like Augustine's. They take time, although something triggers it off. Hmm. You know, with Augustine, it was Tolly Leggi hearing those words in the garden, hmm. pick up and read, and he picks up the New Testament and, and, and reads from the letter of the Ephesians. Uh, in Newman's case, of course, there was a similar kind of... Um, uh, words that struck him, um, and that was Securus Judicat Orbis Terrarum, uh, which he read in this review, their words of St. Augustine, uh, uh, replied to the Donatist heresy in North Africa, or schism in North Africa. And Augustine's point is the Donatists, you know, whatever they may say, the fact is the church is against them, the universal church condemns them, which is still the case today, isn't it? As Newman loved to point out, the, fa the fathers used to say to people, when you go to a strange city, don't ask for the Christian church, ask for the Catholic Church, because there is only one church that dares call itself Catholic. And that's still true today, isn't it? Still true today. Father, during your, your early life as a, uh, an Anglican, then as an Anglo-Catholic, uh, you're now a priest. Mm. Did you hear an early calling to the priesthood, or when did that happen in your spiritual No, journey? no, that was much, much later. I mean, I, 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 possibly I'd had thoughts of when I became a Catholic, I suppose most commons do. No, I was teaching English literature at a university in, in Britain, and, um, and, it was, was, uh, and I began, it was really my interest in Newman actually began then, because I was, um, I began to, um, well, I'd already begun when I was a doctoral student getting interested in him as a, obviously a very interesting, great prose writer. So my interest in Newman was really literary to begin with. And then I got more and more and read, read more and more Newman, and one thing led to another. And I just thought, and I felt that the call to, uh, yes, to the priesthood, rather than teaching English literature, I thought I would like to try and um, <laughs> teach the gospel to people. And now you're a, a, a pastor of a parish? I have a small parish and I teach here in the theology faculty in Oxford as well. Now tell the, the folk, if you would, about your wonderful little parish out there in Burford. Is that you're still at Burford? Yes, I am, yes. Yeah, I um, visited you there and it's a wonderful little town. Yes, well, it's, well, it's the, we get many American visitors, of course, during the year, some of whom have seen me on EWTN. <laughs> uh, well, it's the beginning of the, the, the gateway to the Cotswolds, I suppose, the fam these famous hills north of Oxford, uh, where 
art and nature have so superbly combined mm. that the row of the sloping undulating hills covered in sheep with a lot of sheep and these beautiful and the beautiful grey stone making yeah. the beautiful medieval churches because of course that area was I suppose was the richest area in England in the Middle Ages because the Cotswolds that area of England and other parts of England provided the um, the wool for the whole of Europe it's a beautiful part hence all those marvelous medieval churches yeah, endowed by rich people uh, in a beautiful little church where you're the pastor. Uh, well, the church, yes, we're, we're actually rebuilding the church at the moment. Okay. So next time you come, you'll see something new. Oh, okay, a little bit different. <laughs> it, as a scholar to Newman, many of the audience may never have read anything by Newman, and here he wrote 150 years ago or so. What would you suggest a person begin if they wanted to experience Newman's teaching, his prose, his theology? Well, you know, I'd be tempted to say, um, read his novel, Callista which uh, I know is in print in the United States. Um, it's set in, in North Africa in the third century, and it's a story of how a pagan who becomes a Christian, a story of conversion. Um, but it brings out many of Newman's most important thoughts, actually. His other novel, Loss and Gain, which is very fairly autobiographical and set in Oxford, um, isn't, isn't such a, is in many ways not such an interesting novel. I think Callista really, and it's such a, and it's such a good read too. It's a wonderful historical novel. So for the, for the person who's a real beginner, I would suggest Callista. If you want to read, um, if, you, if you want to do some, read some theology though, I think Newman's famous Oxford University sermon on the theory of developments in Christian doctrine is, is, is perhaps the most exciting thing in the way he ever wrote. Because it's there he adumbrates the argument of the essay on the development of Christian doctrine. And the, the, the sense of excitement with which he writes as he's exploring this concept of, of doctrinal development. You know, as we close here, this might be ad, asking a bit much, but could you summarize his quick theory on the essay of development doctrine? Because some, you know, obviously have not read the book and may not even understand how we approach this idea of how <clears throat> some people think that the Catholics just all of a sudden decide on the assumption of Mary and define yes, at that yes. point. Explain Newman's d development theory. Well, Newman had seen very, very early on in his very first book, he'd understood, of course, that there was development of doctrine, the early councils. You know, things weren't as explicit before the council. councils actually made the definition. The faith was still there, yes. Newman would have said St. Paul would have believed all this, but he wouldn't have been able to articulate it as the councils did because those questions and the terminology hadn't yet arisen. But to put it in a nutshell, what his theory, his theory is this, that if Christianity is a living idea, he uses this word idea, if it's, if it's a living thing, living theory idea, then it must develop because you, you can't live without changing and developing. And if that is the case then, the, 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 the Church of Christ must be a church which develops, claims to develop, but which has also the mechanism to authenticate those developments through her authority. In Newman's day, the Church of England would not have would not have uh, accepted the idea of development at all. So the Church of England clearly, the Church of England's attitude was that there hadn't been this development. Um, today, of course, the Church of England would embrace the concept of development. Ordination of women, they would say that's a development. Of course they'd have to, yeah. And indeed, his essay was appealed to Bangers. But the other, the crucial part is not just development or change, but the mechanism whereby that development can be authenticated that change can be authenticated as a true development rather than a false corruption, because not all changes are developments. Mm. Interesting. So I think in the development, it's been a while since I read the, mm. the book, that he talks about acorn to the oak. Doesn't he refer to um, that, 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 you know, that you have an acorn, then you have an oak tree, and in essence, you see this living development from the acorn to the oak? Um, do you know, I, I, don't, I can't remember that particular image. I was thinking of that, it came from there. And to me, to but me... There's another image that he does use, which, race, which is something that I've used in relation to Vatican II, where he has this wonderful image of the stream coming out of the hillside. And he says that people think that as the water moves, as it comes out, it's all pure. That you know, that's, that's where you, I mean, paraphrasing yeah. now, I mean, that's where you drink it. As, as the stream goes on, it'll get dirty and muddied, you know, sheep will fall into it and all the rest <laughs> of it. Um, but Newman says that's not the case of religious and philosophical ideas. It, the, 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 the stream, as, as, it, as it flows, it, goes, it grows broader and deeper and clearer. As it comes out of the hillside, it savors of the soil mm. from which it came. Which is very, so that applies to Christianity, the history of, as, as the development makes the, makes the Christian idea clearer and truer, clearer and deeper and truer. Mm. It also applies instantly to the Second Vatican Council because mm -hmm. I believe that council, the real meaning of it is going to become clearer as the years go by and those people who participate in it are not necessarily the people who are most likely to <laughs> understand it. Uh, uh, this image of the, also the acorn oak, I was going to also say yeah, that sorry, I, I like it because that. it seems that our, our Protestant brothers and sisters always want to go back to the acorn mm. 
you know, let's get back to the acorn and the real true church. Well, then you completely throw away all the maturity that was there as a result of that. Yes. But then, then the other thing I was going to say is that what you're saying was they start throwing a women's ordination, other issues. Yeah, yeah. It's like you've got to start with an acorn, but you end up with a birch tree. Well, you might end up, exactly. <laughs> but of course, it, it comes back to your, business, your, your, your quotation, to cease uh, to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. But because where do you find this acorn? <laughs> where is it? Because there's development already in the Gospels, isn't there? St. John's Gospel is very different from St. Mark's Gospel. So where do you draw the line? There is the, uh, the, it's very hard to say where is this primitive Christianity where there is no development. I don't know where you'd, how, how you would do that. Father, really appreciate your time with us, sharing so much. I wondered as we close, could you give our audience a blessing? Yes, by all means. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for joining us. Thank very, you for your ministry and also for your witness. Well, thank you for, for EW10, which oh. is such a blessing to us all. Well, thank you. And uh, you've helped so many of us understand Newman in a much deeper That's way. Kind of you've been a great gift to the church and, and to all of our faith. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this special edition of The Journey Home. I hope you'll join us on the other programs that we're taping here in England to hear the uh, conversion stories of men and women here in this country whose authors and the witness of the faith has influenced so much of us. So again, God bless, and I'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm.